If you think about it, electromagnetism is quite an amazing feature of our universe. To truly make sense of its fundamental principles and equations, one of the abstract ideas you need to be familiar with is the concept of flux. And what better to illustrate this notion by introducing you to a pillar of electromagnetism, Gauss law. So, fasten your seat belts and enjoy the show. Welcome to Physics Made Easy. It's been a long time, and it's so nice to be able to post again for you. So for the comeback, I chose a really nice topic. After the video on capacitors, many of you have asked me for a similar video dealing with inductors. But for inductance, there are many notions to understand first. So, like I say to my students, one step at a time. And that first step is understanding the concept of flux. In this video, I will discuss with you the concept of flux and illustrate this by introducing you to a super important law in electrostatics, Gauss law, which is, by the way, also the first of Maxwell's equations. Oh, and before we start, I had a few problems with the light when shooting the video. So please forgive me if I'm looking a little gray. That's not me. I'm full of colors inside. But I know that you know that. Okay, are you ready? Let's begin. Follow me. Imagine water flowing in a tube for which the inner diameter is not constant. You can see the water like a three-dimensional vectorial field where each point is associated with the water's velocity in meters per second. I drew here the flow lines which represent the path that a molecule of water takes. The velocity vectors are tangent to these flow lines, so the flow lines can actually be seen like the field lines of a velocity field. Now, look at how the density of the field lines intensifies when you arrive closer to a narrow cross-section. You know that in this section, the speed of the water must be higher because the flow rate has to stay constant at all positions of the tube. In other words, the density of field lines represents the velocity of the water. If you want, you can also say that the field line density represents the strength of the velocity field. Now, consider any cross-section perpendicular to that flow, expressed in meter square. Multiply it by the velocity and you get a volume per unit time which is also a flow rate in meter cubes per second. That's what the flux of the velocity field is, the flow rate. The flow rate is a quantity that stays constant whatever the size of the cross-section of the tube, as suggested by the constant number of field lines passing through all cross-sections. The flux, or here the flow rate of water, is represented by the number of field lines passing through an area. This is where we can relate to electric and magnetic fields. The field line density represents the strength of the field. When you multiply it by an area, the quantity you get is naturally proportional to the number of field lines. You can see this like an amount of fields flowing through a given area. Make the area bigger and you get more fields passing through. That's what flux is, the amount of field flowing through an area. Now, for my purest viewers, please forgive me for what's to come, because I will allow myself a very approximate image that I find useful to visualize the idea of a field which is flowing. Go back to the tube we've seen before, and imagine you place an object in the flowing water. What happens to that object? Well, the object starts moving. That means that it is experiencing a force tangent to the velocity field lines. Now, do the same thing with a charge in an electric field. This charge feels a force and starts moving along the field lines. Do you see how the two phenomena look alike? However, please be cautious about this analogy. 
it is very approximate. And actually, it's only kind of a little valid during the first seconds. Yes, because the object in the water will end up very soon at a constant velocity, while the electric charge will continue accelerating in the electric field. So the dynamics are different. Yeah, so the analogy is actually rigorously incorrect. But it can be very useful when you want to try and visualize the flow of an electric field like if it was a physical object, you know? We'll have occasions in this video to see why that is. For example, a little later, I'll discuss about Gauss's law. Referring to this analogy can provide some extra clarity about what's going on. Okay, that's it for the conceptual part. Let's look now at how to calculate a flux. First, let me show you how to represent an area with a vector. Yes, an area can be represented by a unique specific vector, the area vector. The direction of that vector is perpendicular to the plane containing the area. The magnitude of this vector is proportional to the size of the area. Imagine a uniform vectorial field X. Now consider an area for which the vector A is aligned with the field strength vector X, thus also aligned with the field lines of field X. Here, to calculate the flux of X through A, you just need to multiply the magnitude of the field strength vector with the magnitude of the area vector. But what if the area is not perpendicular to the field lines? In this drawing, you see that the vector area is making an angle theta with the field vector. If you place yourself in the perspective of the field, you know, like if you were in the flow, the apparent area you are going to go through is now a prime, not a. But the magnitude of a prime is equal to a cosine theta. So the flux flowing through that area is a product of the field strength vector x and of the vector a prime, or a cosine theta. In other words, the flux is a dot product of vectors x and a. Now, what about if the field is not uniform, or if the area is curved, or both? In that case, you just need to consider a differential area dA in which the field can be considered constant. The flux passing through dA will therefore be the dot product between vector x and vector dA. To find the full flux passing through the area A, you just need to integrate over A. Oh, and a final thought. We've seen that the density of field lines represent the field strength, right? And we've also seen that the number of field lines passing through an area represents the flux of the field through that area. The field strength is thus a flux density. This is why in certain textbooks you might encounter terms like magnetic flux density when it's actually referring to the magnetic field strength. Magnetic flux density and magnetic field strength mean the same thing. If you are still here, I believe that now you have a clear idea of what a flux is. I will show you how important it is to understand well this notion. For that, I will use as an example a very important law in electrostatics, actually the main law in electrostatics, Gauss law. Gauss law is actually quite straightforward. It states that the electric field flux going through a closed surface is proportional to the charges enclosed in that surface. Such a surface is called a Gaussian surface. Let's imagine a positive point charge Q that we place in space. As you have learned in a previous video, the charge generates an electric field around it, and therefore field lines. The field lines represent the path that another positive charge would take if placed in the field. To play a little with the analogy of the water flow, you can imagine the point charge being like a water source, from where water would be pouring in all directions. Place an object nearby that source, and the water flow will push the object away from the source. Let's go back to the charge Q and draw around it a spherical surface. We can calculate the electric flux passing through that surface by integrating the dot product between E, the electric field strength vector, and dA, the differential area vector. 
The circle on the integral sign just indicates that the surface we're integrating over is closed. Gold's law states that the flux passing through that surface only depends on the charges enclosed within it and the permittivity of the environment, here vacuum. If you need to brush up on what permittivity is, check my video about dielectrics. So, we have the electric flux through that surface, which is equal to the integral of the dot product between E and dA, but also equal to the charge enclosed divided by a constant, the permittivity of vacuum. This relationship allows to calculate the electric field strength at the level of the surface. That is, at any distance we want, any position we want, because we can choose the surface we want. I will illustrate this later by showing you how from this relationship we can derive Coulomb's law. What this law implies, and that's really important, is that the flux does not depend on the shape or the size of the closed surface, and that it does not depend either on any charges located outside of that surface. Let me prove that to you. The flux is proportional to the number of field lines, right? So let's draw a bigger sphere around the charge Q. As you can see, that doesn't change the number of lines crossing the surface. So the amount of field flowing through, thus the flux, does not change with the size of the surface. On the other hand, you see that the density of field lines is smaller. So on a larger surface, the strength of the field is smaller. It's like if the field got diluted further you are away from the source. To conclude, for larger surfaces, the electric field strength decreases, but not the flux. Yeah, for this one, I have a nice analogy, still with water flow. Consider a small river with a given flow rate. Now imagine that further along, the river becomes wider. So the velocity of the water changes, but not the flow rate. The velocity field strength decreases with the width of the river, but not the flux. Up to now, we've been considering spherical surfaces, that is with high symmetry. Now let's get crazy and consider a crazy Gaussian surface, like this one. So here, the field lines are exiting the volume defined by the Gaussian surface, right? But you can see that because of this crazy surface, some come back in, there and here. But note that they all go out again. Overall, all entrances and exits cancel each other. So in the end, the number of lines crossing the surface remains constant. As a conclusion, the electric field flux does not depend on the shape or size of the Gaussian surface. Let's come back to the Gaussian spherical surface S that is around the charge Q. What if I placed another charge, Q2, outside of that surface? Would it affect the flux passing through it? As you see on the drawing, Q2 will create an electric field, thus an electric flux. The field lines originating from Q2 that enter the surface S will all come out the other side. And that is true wherever you place Q2, as long as it is outside of the volume defined by the Gaussian surface. This results in an overall flux through S due to Q2 being zero. That is why only enclosed charges participate to the flux. Okay, so now you know what Gauss law is. Let's apply it. Let's derive the well-known Coulomb's law from it. So I picked up the whiteboard uh, to do this little derivation for you, where I'm going to use Gauss law to end up with Coulomb's law. Right, so a reminder of what Coulomb's law is. If you have two charges, Q1 and Q2, separated by a distance r, there'll be a force of electrical origin between them, which is proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. K, the Coulomb constant, will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, where epsilon 0 is a permittivity of vacuum. OK, I want to prove this with Gauss law. So I'm going to put myself in context. I'm going to define a charge Q1 and define a Gaussian surface around that charge, which is a sphere of radius r. What is a flux going through that surface? The flux going through that surface is the closed integral of the electric field strength vector dot producted with a differential uh, surface vector. First, let's calculate the dot product here. If I take 
a little piece of Avio DS here. And I draw the surface vector, so DS like that. Obviously, DS would be perpendicular to the surface, right? Let's look at the charge Q1. Q1 is a punctual charge, so it generates a radial field, meaning the field lines originate from Q1 and go in all directions and are perpendicular to the surface of a sphere around it. So field lines and DS are aligned. Now an electric field strength is tangent to the field line, so it will also be aligned with DS, so E1 will be collinear with ds. So I can write this, e1, ds. And the cosine of the angle between the two is 1. So I went directly from vectors to magnitudes. Now e1 on the surface of the sphere, by all points on the surface of the sphere, I had the same distance from the charge q1. So the magnitude of e1 will be the same everywhere on the sphere. So I can remove it from the integral. Now this integral is done over the whole surface of the sphere, so I should put S here. Well, the surface of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. <laughs> so I can write that the flux going through that surface is equal to E1 by 4 pi r squared. And that's where the magic of Gauss rule is going to come in. So I'll rewrite this again. But it is also equal to the enclosed charge divided by the permittivity of a vacuum, so Q1 over epsilon 0. And I can re rearrange E1, and I get the magnitude of E1 at any point on the sphere is Q1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So now let's place a charge Q2 on the surface of the sphere. I'll place it here. You see it will be at a distance r from Q1 and subject it to the field E1 due to Q1. So there'll be a force on Q2, so I'll write it force of 1 on 2, which will be equal to Q2 E1. And I can just substitute E1 in here, and I get Q2 Q1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. I think you can start to see where I'm going to, <laughs> because the force of 1 on 2 will be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 by q1 q2 over r squared. Done. Coulomb's law. How cool is that? That's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this video and that for you the concept of flux is clearer than before. Next video should bring you another brick of knowledge required for reaching our ultimate goal, which is understanding inductance probably something about magnetic fields, I still have to write the script. So stay tuned and don't forget to like, subscribe and smash that notification bell. It really encourages me in making new videos. In the meantime, I do wish you the best and I'll see you soon for the next episode of Physics Made Easy. Ciao.